Hello everyone and welcome to QuickMed, where medicine is explained quickly and easily. Today we will be discussing the different types of shock and how to differentiate between them, so let's get to it. Before we get started, we need to understand three different hemodynamic measures that are important when we're talking about shock. The first is cardiac output, which is defined by stroke volume times heart rate. The next is systemic vascular resistance, which we can look at the perfusion of the extremities to better understand. And then the third is central pressure, which is determined by the jugular venous pressure. So let's start with our first type of shock, which is hypovolemic shock. And this is when you have reduced preload as a result of many different things, such as gastrointestinal bleeds, refractory vomiting or diarrhea, or extensive burns. And as a result of this reduced preload, you also have a reduction in cardiac output. And we know that when cardiac output is reduced, we have a decline in circulating blood volume and a hypotension as a result. This leads to the activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system in order to compensate for this decrease in perfusion. And so what do we see on physical exam here? We'll find decreased skin turgor, dry mucous membranes, and a low jugular venous pressure, all indicating signs of hypovolemia, as well as cool extremities indicating vasoconstriction as a result of trying to maintain blood pressure. And when it comes to treatment of hypovolemic shock, the goal really is to replace the volume that's been lost in the form of fluids or blood products. Let's now turn our attention to our three different hemodynamic measures and see how they play out in hypovolemic shock. So as we said, cardiac output is going to be low here. Systemic vascular resistance will be high in order to compensate for that decrease in cardiac output. And central venous pressure is going to be low here because of the loss of volume. Let's now move on to our second form of shock, septic shock, which is a dysregulated host response to infection. In septic shock, we have a release of inflammatory mediators that cause profound vasodilation as well as endothelial damage. This leads to decreased peripheral vascular resistance as well as capillary leak. As a result of this, there's a compensatory increase in cardiac output initially, which is known as the warm shock phase, and this is manifested in a patient's warm skin that the boards often like to test you on. So considering this, we often view septic shock as a hyperdynamic state in which cardiac output is increased and peripheral vascular resistance is decreased. And this is important to keep in mind because it's different from the other types of shock. On physical exam, as we mentioned, the patients will have warm extremities initially, and the jugular venous pressure will also be low here. We treat septic shock with aggressive fluid resuscitation as well as broad spectrum antibiotics to treat the underlying infection. So let's summarize our three hemodynamic measures again. As we mentioned, cardiac output here is going to be high as a form of compensation for the decrease in systemic vascular resistance that occurs with the vasodilation that we see. And central venous pressure here is likely low because of hypovolemia as well as capillary leak. Let's now discuss cardiogenic shock, which is when the heart is unable to pump effectively, leading to a global hypoperfusion state. As a result of this reduced cardiac output, we again have activation of the RAS system in order to compensate for that decrease in cardiac output. So what do we see on physical exam? We'll find an elevated jugular venous pressure. And this is because when you have a decrease in cardiac output, you have blood backing up into the venous circulation as less is going into the arterial circulation. Patients will also present with murmurs or crackles, peripheral edema, as well as cold extremities. On imaging, which you might be shown a picture of on a test question, you might see an enlarged heart or pulmonary venous congestion. And treatment really involves addressing the underlying cause of the cardiogenic shock, as well as administering inotropes or vasopressors if needed to maintain perfusion. So as we discussed, with cardiogenic shock, you'll have low cardiac output, which is the ultimate cause of what's happening, as well as high systemic vascular resistance with your vasoconstriction, and then a high central venous pressure as a result of this blood backing up into the venous circulation. And our fourth type of shock here is obstructive shock, which is when you have an anatomical blockage of the great vessels of the heart. And these causes can range from a tension pneumothorax to restrictive cardiomyopathy to a pulmonary embolism, among others. What's interesting about obstructive shock is that on physical exam, patients will have an elevated jugular venous pressure as a result of this backup of fluid, but you won't have any signs of volume overload that you oftentimes see with heart failure or cardiogenic shock. Treatment here really depends on the underlying cause because once you've removed the obstruction, you've pretty much fixed the issue. And when we look at our three hemodynamic measures here, we can see that cardiogenic and obstructive shock are very similar. So again, you'll see a low cardiac output as a result of the obstruction, an increase in systemic vascular resistance as a form of compensation, and an increase in central venous pressure as a result of that blood backing up into the venous circulation.
All right, so now we discussed the three different hemodynamic measures with each type of shock. And as you look at this table, just some things to keep in mind. Cardiac output as well as systemic vascular resistance will oftentimes have a reciprocal relationship. And unlike the other three types of shock, septic shock is going to have a low systemic vascular resistance as well as a high cardiac output as a result of that hyperdynamic state that we discussed. These details can oftentimes seem a little bit overwhelming, but if you truly understand what happens with each type of shock, it's very easy to recall what will happen to each hemodynamic measure that we look at. So make sure you understand the underlying pathology and you'll easily be able to identify what's high and what's low. All right, everyone, we hope you found this helpful. If you did, please make sure to like and subscribe so that we can continue to do what we're doing. And if you have any questions, leave them down below. As always, good luck setting everyone.